Father, I thank you for the joy of the Lord. I thank you, Lord, that we live in a free nation. We live in a nation whose motto is the Lord is our God. We live in a nation, Lord God, where our founders declared their relationship to you. We live in a nation, Lord, that needs to come back to you. And Lord, let it start with us. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you to this time. I ask, Lord, that you move in a mighty way in everyone's heart. Make us available to be your hands and your heart, your mouth to one another. That we could encourage and uplift and build each other up. Lord, use us and then make us recipients, Lord, where others are used of God to bring encouragement to one another. We've come to worship you. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have come to worship unabashedly and unashamedly. For you are our God and you alone we trust. We know that you love us more than we love ourselves. And we thank you for that love. We want to reciprocate that love in worship this morning and everybody who agreed said amen. amen. As long as you're all standing, join us in worshiping our Lord. today with joy in our hearts yes lord we come to worship you because you are a great and mighty king hallelujah lord yes. we come to worship you because you are the only one who's worthy of our praise you're worthy of all honor and all glory our joy 
is found in you yes. and found in your word. So we come today expecting to see you do great things, expecting yes. to receive from you through your word. Yes. Give us hearts and minds that are open to hear and receive from you. In Jesus' name. This week I've been reading about the battles going on in the Old Testament. And before every battle, the worshipers went first. Because the worship and praise, that's what brings in the Spirit of God and breaks the enemy's background yes. all over. <laughs> so tonight, today I just want to remind you, we are the worshipers coming before this battle. Worship the God in spirit and truth. Splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice, be wrapped himself in light, and darkness tries to hide.
Hallelujah, Father. Great is our God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Amen. We serve such a great God. Praise. a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Salvation is not by works, 
that any man should boast, but by grace. I owe it all to you. It doesn't matter how many projects I get involved in. It doesn't matter how many good things I do. My righteousness and salvation comes from Jesus Christ and him alone. Amen. Amen. Why don't you say good morning to someone? Lord bless you. It's good to have each one of you here. Uh, arrangement. You know, I, I often thought I need to, I, I went to, a, when we were on vacation, I went to a church. And the pastor had this tablet about like this, this. And, and it had a stand and it had a magnet on it. And everything, and just, and it just, uh, it was really cool because going back and forth. But I hate, you know, and, and, and I thought, man, that'd be really cool. But the problem with me is I'm an old school guy. I, I just, I have my Bible. And if you come into my office, there are thousands of books. And I read books. You come to my desk, and I've got books laid out. When I'm studying, I've got books laid out in every direction, and they're open. And I just look back and forth. I'm telling you what, I can have a seizure. They do that on my computer. <laughs> we, we have an art, IT guys that come, and they say, well, you just can divide your computer like this, and it goes like this. And I'm going, you've got to be kidding me. You know, so... Uh, yeah, well, I, I don't know that I'm all that good at anything, but I, I, uh, I like this. A blessed nation. We're blessed because God is our king. And, I, and I'm, this has nothing to do with notes, and it's not back there. Uh, we have the American flag, and I'm not ashamed of the American flag. I hear a lot of people, well, there's Christianity nationalism. What do you mean? I'm glad that God made us a part of this nation. I'm glad we were born here. It doesn't have anything to do with the fact that we're greater than anybody else. It has to do with the fact that the Lord is our God. And, and by the way, in case anybody wants to care, the United States has done over double all the missionaries all the rest of the world has put together. Double. You know, we, we've reached out in the name of Jesus. We're, you know, yeah, we got our faults. There's no ifs, ands, or about it. We're made up of people, and without people, we wouldn't have any faults. But the reality is we're a blessed nation, and we need to understand that and not be ashamed. Of it. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for in it is the power of God. I'm also not ashamed that God had me born in a territory in the United States as a United States citizen. I'm not ashamed of the fact that we welcome over a million legal citizens every year into this country. You know, I, I, I blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And that's not just colloquialism. That's not just a little saying. That's Psalms 33, 12. And by the way, that's just not somebody that gives mouth service. We be, need to be a nation that gives actions to our words. Luke 16, 13 says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. We need to decide whose side we're on. You know, I, 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 these people on Facebook, and Facebook's really good for me because it's pastoral voyeurism. And, uh, and I, but at the same time, it's not so good because I see people who I feel are really divided. We talked about the right to life, sanctity of life last week, and where do we go from here? And, and I talked about a person who has got a PhD. He at one time pastored a church of many thousands, started numerous churches, but we got into a uh, uh, side, sidebar discussion over abortion. He just doesn't think it's that big a deal. And, and I kept thinking, well, you're divided. You're divided. And there were some other things that clearly against God's word that he says, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll just be patient. No, we'll stand for truth. We're not going to point the finger. We're not going to play in the BAME game. We're not going to say we're better than. We're just going to live and do the word. We're not going to argue. We don't need to argue. We just speak the word. That's the whole thing is, don't get, don't get into an argument. Just let, the Bible is like a lion. Just let the lion out. It takes care of itself. You don't see chimpanzees going in front of the lion trying to protect it. Just let the lion, just, then, and then just stop. Let the Holy Spirit do its job. It's not our job to convict. It's the Holy jo Spirit's job to bring conviction. By the way, none of this has to do anything with the sermon. So, okay. Just thank you. Romans 14, 12. 
so then each of us shall give an account of himself before God. This is one of the things, and this isn't a, a, a sermon on our founding too much, but this idea of giving an account before God. We will all give account before God. The Bible says that every, every idle word spoken will give an account before God. Our actions, our decisions, whether we receive Jesus Christ or not, all of that's going to be an account before God. One of, our, one of the things our founding fathers and people up into probably 50 years ago believed very strongly in, even the worst retrobate believed they would give an account. Yeah, well, I won't get into heaven, blah, blah, blah. I'm going straight to hell with all my buddies. Well, that's not the, the, the thing that you may think it is. First of all, you won't see them there. You'll constantly be falling. You ever that feeling of falling? That's the feeling you'll feel always on fire, always aware, everything's black, burning. And again, I've said this numerous times, and I can't prove it scripturally. I believe one of the greatest regrets we'll have in hell, no, no, not we, people that get there, is they'll know they had a choice. And they spurned and rejected the love of God. It was ignorant. It was foolish. It was this. It was that. My job and your job is to love people to life in Jesus Christ. Do all that we can to be an example. Often we're the only epistle someone's going to read. And so it starts with us. I thank God for this nation. I thank God that our motto in this nation is in God we trust. I thank God for how we're founded by Christians. And by the way, you'll see this isn't a Christian nation. It may be turning from that, but we're still a Christian nation. I remember getting my MDiv and arguing because, oh, the students love. And remember, I was 50 when I got, went into my MDiv, pro, my second in my MDiv program. And, oh, they go, oh, we're not a Christian nation anymore. We're not a Christian nation. Well, let's turn it back to one, folks. Well, we don't need to. We'll just, I remember one guy just uh, loved to close the bar on Saturday night, and then he'd help clean it up and open it up on the morning for church. And that's nothing wrong with that. I just got to be careful about bad company corrupts good morals. And so, anyway, that's, I know that's on the sermon. Let me just read a few quotes from our founding fathers. Everybody know who Patrick Henry is? Okay. Give me liberty, give me death. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's, that, that, that's the founding of our nation. People say, well, this isn't... No, no, no. There are, there are two things. And, and we're doing a, a series this fall on the faith of our fathers. Um, we've done a number of series. But we're going to take a look at our founding fathers. And we're going to see what they had to say and what they thought about Jesus Christ. Okay. Patrick Henry. George Washington, when he gave his farewell address after his second term of president, said this. Do not let anyone claim tribute of American patriotism if they even attempt to remove religion from politics. And you need to understand, we say, well, they said religion, they said higher power. They talked about Jesus Christ. They had a different phraseology. That's what just drives me crazy with the dishonest people and the dishonest professors who say, well, they didn't talk about God or Jesus. Yeah, they did. They understood. When they said uh, religion, they talked about Jesus. There was no other religion. Only one Catholic signed the Declaration of Independence. All the rest of them were Christians. Yes, synagogues were here. By the way, there wasn't one Muslim, what do they call it? mosque here. Not one. Bagadida. 
didn't have a cult here yet. See, the reality is that this is a nation that's founded on Christianity with the understanding of the Word of God. John Adams, president, also a born-again believer. We have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions, unbridled by morality and religion. Our Constitution was made for a moral and a religious. He would, and today it would be Christian people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. John Adams. Here's something that might interest you, and I don't mean this to be a history lesson, but it is. You ever heard of separation of church and state? It's not in the Constitution. 1812 letter from John Adams to Thomas Jefferson and Danbury Baptist, who were worried that the government was going to impose a religion. First Amendment has created a wall. This is where the separation, this is where the phrase comes from in a personal letter between Thomas Jefferson and 1812. The First Amendment was created, has created a wall of separation between church and state. Now, they all stop there. Let's read the rest of the letter. But that wall is a one-directional wall. It keeps the government from running the church. But it makes sure that Christian principles will always stay in government. So when you want to deal with people who are ignorant... It's good to have history. Now, on, on, in the fall and the preceding things we've done, you've gotten handout with footnotes and everything else. Keep on to those. Hang on to those. I've had people order them, and Kathy has to copy them off, <laughs> and we send them out because the footnotes are there at a congr congregational, a Congress's co library or other places. And, and just because I uh, can, I'm going to read you a few other things. Samuel Adams, signer of the Declaration of Independence. I rely upon the merits of Jesus Christ for pardon of all my sins. John Charles Carroll, on the mercy of my Redeemer, I rely for salvation and on his mercies, not on the works that I have done in obedience to his precepts. John Witherspoon. I entreat you to the earnest matter to believe in Jesus Christ, for there is no salvation in any other. If you are not reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, if you are not clothed with the spotless robe of his righteousness, you must forever perish. Dr. Benjamin Rush. My only hope of salvation is in the infinite transcendent love of God manifest to the world by the death of his son upon the cross. Nothing but his blood will wash away my sins. I rely exclusively upon it. Lord Jesus, come. Come quickly. I have at least two dozen other letters and parts from, they all kept journals with the same type of we believe in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. This nation was not founded on religion. It was founded on Christianity and the principles of Christianity. Um, so I think it's important that we understand that. Um, let me just go ahead and do this. God was such a central part of our founders' lives that they met in Congress. They met for the first time in Philadelphia in September of 1774, two years before the signing of the Declaration. They opened with prayer with zero complaints. The prayer meeting was not some routine dishwater prayer, as so is often prayed in public meetings today. But according to the writings of those who were there, they prayed for over an hour, and they studied four chapters of the Bible in the first meeting of Congress for the Declaration of Independence. The prayers and Bible study were so profound that John Adams wrote to his wife, we still have the letter, I never saw a greater effect upon an audience. It seemed as heaven had ordained the psalm to be read on that morning. 
I must beg you to read the psalm. Read this letter in the 35th psalm to your friends. Read it to your father. Abigail's, Adam's father was Reverend Joseph William Smith. And uh, another signer, Silas Doreen, who's another signer on the Declaration, wrote, he wrote at the time of this prayer, and he said, it was so powerful that even Quakers shed tears. <laughs> What's the psalm that they, they, they read? Now remember, they are writing, they are beginning to write the 40th, the, the, the Declaration of Independence. They, they are beginning to list why they're going to move away to become a separate nation. These are men with strong beliefs in Jesus Christ. Very educated. I'm going to read it out of the Living Bible. Psalms 35. Harass these hecklers, God. Punch them in their punch these billies in the nose. Grab a weapon, anything at hand, and stand up for me. Get ready to throw the spear or aim the javelin at the people who are out to get me. Reassure me. Let me hear you say, I'll save you. Then those thugs who try to knife me in the back make them look foolish. Frustrate all those planting my downfall. It goes on and on and on and on and on. Uh, you might have fun reading the 35th Psalm because it's the Psalm that was read in the opening of the first congressional and it moved even Quakers to tears. <laughs> I, I thought that, was, that it's interesting because we seem to believe that they just decided, here's what we're going to do. We're going to just make this thing up. I think they understood that if we're going to be a nation, we be, need to be a nation founded on the Word of God. Amen? In God we trust. First printed in 1964 on, in 1864 on money. It's our national motto. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. I believe that most of us, if not all of us, agree that our nation has been blessed. Materially, geographically, educationally, we've had God's protection, provision. We've had miracle after miracle in battle. And we've been blessed with fresh seasons of outpourings of the Holy Spirit to renew our relationships, our commitment to our calling, our Lord Jesus Christ. He blessed this nation. You got the first and second great awakening. You've got the antebellum awakening. You've got the uh, Holy Spirit being poured out. You've got the 1870s, then you have the 1900s, then you have the 1920s, and then you've got, the you got the, the 1960s. Now, some of you are here are, were alive in the 1960s. Some of you weren't. But I remember the, the revival in the 1960s as a poured out. And in each revival, in each and every revival, you always had outcast who got it first. Especially in the second great awakening. Now, in first great awakening, it started at the universities. But then in everything, every awakening, everybody heard of the hippie generation? Boy, they took the gospel because they found peace. They found purpose. They found promise. They found the presence of Almighty God to fulfill that longing in their life. They're the generation after World War II whose parents wanted them to have everything their parents didn't have. That's a bad thing. It seems good that I want to just give you everything. And by the way, I apologize. I should have, I was reminded of children returned to children, released to children's church, but I see they're gone. So, anyway, I believe that we have been blessed. We've been have the Holy Spirit. The, 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 the hippie generation movement is the one that affected me the most. Because at the tail end of that is when I came back to the Lord and got saved and delivered. Now, 
I don't know in my entire years as pastoring I ever quoted an uh, atheist. So here's your first time I've ever quoted an atheist. A progressive atheist. His name is Maximilian Robespierre. You know who he is? Ever heard the name? He was a French progressive liberal lawyer. He was also the heady, he was the leading figure in the reign of terror. He executed, beheaded with guillotine over 40,000 people. His word for them was imbeciles, just in the city of France and Paris. He had arrested and executed over 100,000 others in the countryside. Who are these imbeciles? That this judge, by the way, he was ju- chief prosecutor, judge, all rolled into one. His main attempt, these imbeciles, was to wipe out Christianity from France. Any priest that didn't escape was beheaded. Any nun that didn't escape was beheaded. Any clergyman that didn't escape was beheaded. Anybody that that stood up and said, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, was accused. The thing is, he was not only the accuser, the chief accuser, he was the chief judge. So, you're accused, you're guilty, lop off their heads. Now, what's interesting about him, especially if you read, and I've read not a lot, but I've read a few hundred pages on him, that he championed equal rights as long as he held superior rights. And what's, and I probably will go back and, and do it. He espoused almost every single one of today's liberal mantras. All the slogans that we see out today, justice for all, all these kind of things. Equality. Brotherhood. He espoused. Didn't live up to him, but just espoused him. He turned Notre Dame, the cathedral, into a brothel. And the only reason I'm quoting him is this. Here's his quote. The secret of freedom lies in educating people. Whereas the secret of tyranny is keeping them ignorant. Well, church, it's time to wake up and quit being ignorant. It's time to know what the Word of God says and live accordingly no matter what the world says. We need to be a people. I'm not angry at the world. Sinners sin. Don't point your finger. Don't laugh. Sinners sin. Paul says, for us such were you and I. But we need to be a people who can stand up and say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've been around me more than five minutes, you know that's my verse for life. For in it is the power of God. France's motto, national motto, up until Napoleon took over was, we have no God but reason. Remember, we talked about this before. France has never won a war by herself since then. She's been conquered twice. She's lost all her holdings in outlying countries. You think a country that rejects God might be rejected by God. That's what the Word of God says. I think we need to come back to where we acknowledge we're a Christian nation. I I can't tell you how many times, dozens and dozens and dozens, I stood up to these 20-some-year-olds who were getting their master's degrees, usually in theology or psychology, and they were in a class with me. We're not a Christian. Yes, we are. No, we're not. Can't you do? Yes, we are. Go home and live in your mama's basement. One kid and I got into it so bad. I said, have you ever held a full-time job? No. 
Where do you live? With my parents. How old are you? 25. Who paid for your undereducation, your, your, your first degree? My parents. Who's paying for your grad degree? My parents. Do you own a car? Well, yeah, my parents gave it to me. And we were arguing the fact that we're not only not a Christian nation, but that the employer has the right to tell the employer when he needs to come to work. And a bunch of other stuff. And right in front of the class, I said, child, and I called him child. You need to move out of mommy and daddy's basement. You need to give them back their car. You need to go get a real job and support yourself. And then you come and tell me about your liberal. Well, you're just an old blank blank. They allow that in college nowadays. I had one couple I knew that were starting a church. I said, I'd love to come visit. Well, I wasn't pastoring. We don't want old, fat, white, conservative Republicans coming to our church. And you know what really hurt me? I was 45 pounds less then. (laughs) (laughs) Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. I believe we recognize that God is. We are a blessed nation. And I'm not going to allow anybody in my presence to say we're, we're, we're not a Christian nation. I'll say, yes, we are. <laughs> Maybe you're not, but this nation is founded. Why don't you read instead of be a little puppet for everybody else? Now, this point is this. Scripture is not silent about nations. Scripture teaches us that God is greater than all nations. Amen. That all nations, that nations come and go. And that God uses nations as part of his plan. And that all people from all nations, and and that people from all nations, will and are a part of his kingdom. We don't have an exclusive right on the kingdom of God. We've got a responsibility to stand up and share the gospel. The Bible says that he blesses nations where he is God. Blesses the nation where God is the Lord. Scripture also teaches us specifically that a nation, what a nation should do in order to receive the blessings and continue in the blessings of God. Psalms, the book, is broken down into five sections. And each section has a different theme. And the first section is called the Songs of David. And it's 1 through 40, let me look at my notes, 41. And it's called the Blessed. Songs of David. It starts, Blessed is the man, Psalms 1 1. And it goes on and on, and every, every chapter therein. When you get to chapter 33, and it's all throughout here, I just picked one, I just picked chapter 33. But all through there, it says, The nation's blessed that follows the Lord. The nation is a blessed that, that cares for the poor. The nation is blessed and God smiles upon it. And he talks about it over and over and over. But I just, I, I grabbed Psalms 33. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his inheritance. And, 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 and there's a, it's, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. It's throughout the first 41 chapters of Psalms. And it breaks it down in Psalms, how, how to continue with this concept of blessing how the people are to live in the ways of the lord they're to trust they're to obey they're to worship they're to seek they're to delight they're to meditate they're to fear these are some of the words in these first 40 chapters that did say hey this is how a person has to live their life a nation has to live its life if it wants to be blessed and follow the lord we're going to focus on 33 But I want to make sure that you understand, the United States of America is a Christian nation. Would you say that with me? United States of America is a Christian nation. We're in trouble. Because the Bible's just as clear what happens to nations when they turn their backs on God. But I believe there's enough remnant in this nation to turn it back around again. And I believe it's time this church, you and I repent. We need to repent. We need to get right with God. And then we need to live the life that displays the gospel, that loves people to life through Jesus Christ. 
Psalms 33, we clearly see what it means to be a nation whose God is the Lord. See, I got so excited I stood up. <laughs> Verses 1 to 3, a people who acknowledge and worship the living God. Verses 4 and 5, a people who seek to know and do what the Word of God calls them to do. Verse 8, a people who fear, awe, wonder the Lord and show Him reverence in all that they do. Verses 10 through 12, a people who seek the Lord's counsel, not their own who acknowledge God and His rule. Verses 13 to 15, a people who know that they are accountable to God. That's a, that's, see, there's a great missing point, in my opinion, in today. Most people who are not serving God do not believe, do, do not believe they will have an account to give an account. This is it. Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Who was that lady? I know, that's why it irks me. Um, but uh, that song, that bouncing around, whatever. But the reality is they don't believe. See, you and I need to be firmly understand we are going to give an account. Not for our sins. Our sins are under the blood of Jesus Christ. But every idle word. We judge by the acts that we did according to what God has called us to do, the works that we did. By the way, those works were prepared beforehand that we should accomplish them before there was time. Before you were twinkling in your daddy's eye, God had works for you to do for him. And we get to be rewarded on those works. That's pretty cool. He set up works that we, through him, could accomplish so then we could be rewarded by doing the works. That's Ephesians 2.10. People who know they're accountable. I talk to people continuously who absolutely do not believe there's, there, there, there's an account. No, this is all there is. Die, nothingness. When you realize that, they, that, that as our forefathers did, and foremothers, sounds like a strange word. By the way, foremothers, <laughs> that's tough. <laughs> We're, we're kicking around the idea of going to Israel in a couple of years. And so we're looking into it and talking to some things. And if you're interested, we'll come see us because we're putting a, a list together right now. But four mothers. Okay, one of the things when you go to Israel, know that you're going to go to about five sites where Jesus was born. Mary had like a four day labor. They just kept moving her from site to site. <laughs> I'm sorry. See, that's what happens when, you know, there's too many, I wasted too many brain cells. Stuff got stuck in the wrong place. Verses 13, the people who know that they're accountable to the Lord, he watches them and considers everything that they do. We will give an account. We will give an account before the Lord. I thank God that it's not for my sins. He's already taken care of my sins. My sins are already taken care of. They're done. There's no condemnation. There's no shame to those that are in Christ Jesus, no matter what we did. It's behind us. Verse 16 to 22 tells us that a people that are going to know the blessings of God, a people who will know God and God alone can and will protect and sustain them and protect those who fear him, a people who wait upon the Lord and hope and trust. Quick points. Three. We're going to make it quick. One. A, loved ones, to be a nation whose God is the Lord, we must be a people who reject all false gods that are propped up, worshipped all our way around us. And we must individually return to that place where God and God alone matters most in our lives. Amen? Yeah. At the end of the service, I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask, Lord, where am I to put this? Where do I have a division in my heart? Where am I saying, well, that's not really that big a deal? Where am I saying, well, that's that person's choice? rather than praying for that person? Where am I not going to voice God's word and say what that lifestyle or what that is? Fifty-seven genders. Good grief. And by the way, um, you realize that there's a bill before Congress right now that's trying to make all of the gender nonsense equal to the Civil Rights Bill. So we're going to pray. 
but you cannot make me lie. Oh, how do you put this? You got indoor plumbing, you're a lady. You got outdoor plumbing, you're a man. That's just how it is. God made it. We need to individually return to the place where God and God alone matters, and His Word is supreme over our thoughts. Well, I don't, no, 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 no. I don't really care what other people think about me all that much. I care what God thinks about me. I don't want to have people, I don't want to do things, people dislike me. I don't try to do, I just, that comes natural. It's part of my personality. A couple of weeks from now, I'm going to my 50th class reunion. It's always so. I mean, I've been there a couple of times before, and it's always such fun to go because they're always in such shock. First of all, you're still alive. <laughs> and you're not in prison. And you're a pastor. Oh, that was the, the, the time we went after we'd been pastoring. That was all night. We had people waiting, literally, literally, we had people waiting until four in the morning to talk to us. And then when we left at four in the morning, they caught us in the parking lot. Another couple caught us in the parking lot. What changed? Jesus Christ. It's not real hard. This isn't rocket science, folks. Turn your life over to God. Make a declaration that he and he alone is supreme in my life. His word and his word alone directs my life. And your life will change. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot ter- serve God and man. And, well, God has a lot to say. You know, Jesus said more about finances than he did heaven and hell combined. Because where your treasure is, there is your heart also. What's God word, God saying? Well, no read it my way. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to figure it out on my own. God's word's pretty clear. When we're duplicitous in our lifestyle, in our way that we run the life according to the word of God, we open a door for the enemy to kick our tail. Maybe I shouldn't say kick your tail in church. That's probably not a good thing, huh? Oh, the other one? My description of anatomy? Okay, yeah. Exodus 20, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. No other God, plural, before me. James 1.8, a double-minded person is unstable in all their ways. The gods of success, pleasure, others' approval, wokeness. That's all wokeness is. I want to be approved. I want to be liked. I, 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 know I, I know I have shortcomings, so I'll just be like everybody else. That's a demonic as far as I'm concerned. The, the God of wealth and power, believing we can save the earth. Gia, Gaia, whatever her name is. Mother Earth. We already got our instructions from God. Cultivate, manage, maintain. That's what we were told to do with this earth. If you don't join our cult, if you don't uh, pedal your bicycle, how can I pedal my bicycle? Man, and you hate the earth. I mean... By the way, those that are in the whole environmental thing, and where as far as it comes to pollution and all the rest of that, that's a religion. That has every single category. It's, it's labeled a religion. Gaia is their god, Earth, Mother Earth. And they'll do anything to protect her. Do we, you want to go, go to one of the most ecologically sound places in America? Go to Alaska. You won't see trash on the roads. People pick up their trash. When they go hunting, you pack it out, you pack it in. I remember, oh, no, you just, no, 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 no. We care about the earth. We're supposed to maintain and cultivate it, not worship it. Uh, Stop it, Greg. You're off on a side track here. We have to break away from these demonic whispers that are against God's word. And we need to do it individually so we can do it as a nation. If we want all the blessings of God flowing in our lives. Where's our focus? Where are we compromising? 
Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to direct and correct so we can again flow in the unity of the Spirit? Some of us really recognize, look, I, I, I got relatives doing this and I got friends doing that and I, I'm just going, well, that's their choice. Well, their choice is going to take them straight to hell. It doesn't mean you have to pound on them every time you see them. But you need to at some point lovingly say, Jesus has better planned for you. Jesus knows what it feels to be alienated and rejected. Jesus knows what it feels to have his family turn against him. And I want to tell you that Jesus has a better plan for you. Well, I was born this way. Well, I was born a wretch. That's why they asked if I'd still be alive at my 10 year reunion or in prison. I had to be born again. I was born. Well, we all have to be born again. Where is our worship for? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will not be silent. I will sing of the goodness of God, making melody in my heart, being aware of his presence, his glory around me always. Amen? Two, blessed is the nation that seeks righteousness and justice. Now, here's an interesting thing. How many have ever heard the word social justice? It's not in the Bible. Social justice is not in the Bible. God has very clear definition of justice and has very clear de definition of righteousness. Godliness, righteousness makes a nation great, but sin is a disgrace to any people. For a nation and a kingdom, for the nation and kingdom that will not serve God, you shall perish. Those nations will be utterly laid waste. I'm saying it's time we start praying for our leaders. They're not our leaders. They're our representatives. Let me get that right. They're not my leaders. They're my representative. Righteousness and justice is about doing what is right in God's eyes, not necessarily man's. Amen? The whole just, social justice program, it, it starts in the 1930s, and it starts in South America by a group of priests who think that we've got to slay and kill all the landowners and their families so we can divide up the land. J. Rivera, is that his name? Little bigoted, racist, communist. He was a social... You've seen his face. It's all over the T-shirts. He fought with uh, Fidel Castro. Very racist. Hated blacks. Executed people just for the fun of executing them. And yet in the universities, they... Oh, in fact, in one of our classes... We were doing on somebody in history that we liked. And somebody brought a film on Che Rivera. And I knew it was coming, so I went and did a bunch of research. And I said, oh, isn't that nice? Here, here's some of the things he said, and here's some of the things he did. And you're giving him acclimates in a Christian college, or supposedly it's a Christian university. I said, you need to get your head out of the sand, son. I wasn't like there either. <laughs> we need to pray for our leaders, our representatives, that they will serve the Lord God and do what is right and just in God's eyes, not in the political system. Yeah. Political correctness is not righteousness. It's man's attempt to replace God's righteousness with man's view. It's also manipulation. Three scriptures, quick scripture, righteousness. One, I got to tell you something, folks. We're not righteous, no, not one. By ourselves, we're all sinners. Two, we do not become righteous just by doing what we believe is just and good and nice. Three, we are only made righteous through Jesus Christ. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. All your good works, all your kind things, all your giving the dollar to that person that's standing on the corner doesn't make you righteous. Jesus Christ makes us what's righteous. And then as we do those things that he calls us to do to help the poor to serve, there are the acts that he calls us to do. That we get rewards for. Don't be afraid of the fact that we get rewards in heaven. Oh, I don't care. I do. God said I get to lay up treasures in heaven. 
He said, he's got all these opportunities, if I'll just be obedient to him, that I can accomplish all this stuff, and i got all these treasures in heaven. Man, I'm not a, I, I'm not a wizard at, at finances but, or banking, but that sounds like a good program to me. For we are made, for he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's how we become righteous. Three, blessed is the nation that trusts in the Lord. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. I trust in you, Lord. I trust whatever's going to happen. You've got it. You've got it planned out. And, Lord, I just want to participate. Even, no matter, even if it goes, in my opinion, sideways. See, my opinion is not Scripture. Scripture is Scripture. And just because I pray that somebody hands me a lottery ticket and I win the lottery because I've never bought a... You know, that's one of the only things I've never done in my life is buy a lottery ticket. You know, a lot of you can say a lot of things. You know, you things like, what have you ever done? Or what have you ever done? Where have you ever visited? You know, you've seen those little things. About the only one I got in my life is I've never played a lot. I've never scratched off a lottery ticket. So, so if somebody happens to put one in the offering plate, you'll tempt me. No, I'll scratch it off. Don't worry about it. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. I trust you, Lord. I trust what you have for us. I trust, Lord, that, that we're going to be the people that you've called us to be. I trust, Lord, that we're breaking out of that spirit of fear and intimidity. We're not going to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've given us fear. You've given us a spirit of love and power and of a sound mind. We're going to celebrate the 4th of July, not ashamed to be Americans. And neither ashamed to be Christians. But we're going to live for you, Lord. We're going, to, we're going to live our lives so that we can demonstrate and bring back the blessedness of God. Not only into our lives, but into this nation. We need trust. has to be firmly founded and established in God. His word, his promises, his love, his plans over us. It's our part to pray. And as Reverend Cho said, I pray. And I obey. <laughs> if you've never heard that or seen that, it's hilarious. A million person church in, China, in South Korea. He's interviewed. He's sitting there and the interviewer thinks he's going to get some pearl of wisdom. Reverend Cho, how did you build this church? When he explains, well, 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 what's the secret? And if you've ever seen, uh, ever saw Reverend Cho, he was always smiling. And he goes, I pray and I obey. And the, the poor oh man, you, you had to feel for the, the, the guy that was interviewing him. Because he wanted step one through 11. But he just laughed. I pray and I obey. Folks, that's what we need to do. We need to make sure our hearts are right before God. Then we pray and obey. We love people to life through Jesus Christ. I'm not going to back up. Oh, we're such a terrible place. Yeah, we have some problems, without a doubt. We're still a blessed nation. And the people of God need to return to the blessings of God and to the personal relationship of God. It has to be more than a slogan. It has to be a lifestyle. One nation, one person under God. Our forefathers clearly understood this. And I'll lead my last. I'm going a little long, but I'm going to read my last bit. Second part. Let me cut it down here. What I read from the first was the Congress for the Declaration of Independence. After we had established our independence, we came together and we tried to rule ourselves for two years under Articles of Confederation, but they didn't work. We needed an actual constitution. So the 13 states came together. And there's great states and little states. And the little states were worried about getting squeezed out by the big states. The big states, well, you know what, big states. And they got to the point in August, July, where they're trying to put the Constitution, they're drafting it. They'd been at it for many weeks. In fact, they'd been pitted against and arguing so much 
that, that uh, a couple of the smaller state representatives went home. It was, the contention was so bad, it, it was almost derailing the whole constitutional thing, which would have divided and ruined the nation. Remember that at every congressional meeting, at every one of these things, there's three scribes, a minimum of three scribes working. As recorded in James Madison details records, at the height of the frustration and the heat of the morning were members that had already gone home. Benjamin Franklin, who was 81 and the senior member and probably the most respected man among them for his ability to bring calmness. He stood up and addressed the Congress at this critical moment. Here's the ending of his address. I have lived, sir, a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proof I see of this truth, that God governs the affairs of men. And if the sparrow cannot fall to the ground without him notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the most sacred writings, that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that built it. I firmly believe this, and I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. We shall be divided by our partial local interest, our project shall be confused, and we ourselves shall become a reproach and a key word down to future ages. And what is worse, mankind may hereafter from this unfortunate instance despair of establishing governments with human wisdom and leave by human wisdom and leave it to chance or conquest. I therefore beg leave no more that henceforth prayers employing the assistance of heaven and its blessings on our deliberation be held in this assembly before we proceed to business and that one of the clergy of this city be requested to officiate that service. They got down on their hands and knees and they cried out to God and they repented and they forgave one another and their attitudes changed. After this address, James Madison made a motion which was seconded by Roger Sherman of Connecticut. And it's written in the congressional record that a sermon must be preached at the request of the convention at the 4th of July. I wonder if Congress is going to have a sermon on a clergy on the 4th of July. It's in the congressional record. It's passed. The anniversary of independence. And henceforth, prayer shall be used in yea convention every morning. You realize that Congress starts every session in prayer? Unfortunately, it's not Christians much anymore. We're still a Christian nation. We're still, I, look, we're still a Christian nation. Let's be proud of what God is doing in this nation. Lord, turn our hearts. Turn the hearts of our representatives back to you. Lord, I pray that you, you, you move within the halls of Congress and the, and the state houses and even school boards. Lord, you move on their hearts. You move on their hearts. We're praying for them, Lord. And if they will not, and you know whether they will or not, Lord, I pray the prayer of David. If they will. Lord, we in this place this morning are open to correction. Lord, we're open to be convicted of areas where we're double-minded. Lord, heal us that we may be healed. Correct us that we may be whole. Forgive us that we may walk in the freedom that you have called us to. John, I to God and he'll dry it on you. 
cleanse your hands, you sinner. Purify your hearts, devil-minded. Father, help us be a people who recognize where we have been complacent. We have shrugged off your morality and put in its place our mediocrity to be liked. Forgive us, Lord, of not speaking up when your Holy Spirit told us to speak up and forgive us, Lord, for speaking up when we should have stayed shut up. Lord, we commit to you. And I pray for every person here, Lord, that we would be proud to be Americans and proud to be Christians. Christians first and then Americans. Lord, you call this nation, it's undeniable, founded by Christians. Lord, bless this nation. Heal our land, Lord. Heal our land. And begin by forgiving us of our duplicity, of our wokeness, of our political correctness. Holy Spirit, we invite you afresh and anew into every life. Rejuvenate us, Lord. Not in arrogance, but in the fear and the awe and the wonder of God. Stir up the gift that lies in each one of us. And we will stir it to blow on the flames that once burned bright. That we can make a difference in the community, first in our home, then in the community, then in the state, than in this nation. But Lord, let it start with us in Jesus' name. Amen. A message we needed this morning, especially on this day. In Acts 2.44, it mentions the early church. In fact, it's the first time that we hear of the early church as a church. And uh, you can take time, maybe this afternoon, I'm not going to read the scripture, but basically the many things that transpire because people, believers, met together. And there's a whole list of things. One of them that they did on a daily basis, believe it or not, we do it on a monthly basis. They broke bed. They... Thank you. And so, uh, if you look back at the, way back to the Passover when Jesus, or God established the covenant uh, between Israel and himself, they celebrated it, what, once a year, once a year. So we have progressed, and I believe there's purpose to that as we'll discover this morning. And I want to kind of just share this. I'm going to read most of it, but I believe that... uh, uh, we've uh, had, had a preparation of our hearts this morning to receive what God would want us to hear. Now, the new covenant is for the forgiveness of sins in the power of the blood. His grace will apply to every situation in our lives. Every situation in our lives, no matter what we're going through, His grace what is sufficient for us. The power of the blood of Jesus has to do with a debt being paid in full and God's power reaching his people. The pattern, purpose, and we'll talk about this more, the pattern, purpose, and power for presenting and receiving the Holy Communion is contained in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-three through 26. That's what we're going to read this morning. Most of us, because of every time we share communion, we read the scripture, and even beyond that, we know it. But I want to read part of it this morning. It says, For I received, and this is Paul speaking, For I received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cups after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We, this morning, make room for Jesus to work in us as we partake together in Holy Communion, Amen. remembering his sacrifice and that this is part of God's plan. It's not just something that we made up because we wanted to do so. That is God's plan this morning that each of us participate in communion. It goes on as we do this in remembrance of the Lord Jesus. For as often he eat this brick bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We make room for Jesus to work in us as we partake together in Holy Communion, remembering his sacrifice and God's plan, remembering and honoring what God has done is vital to receiving all he has to offer us. So as we receive communion this morning, he wants to rem us to remember what he has done for us. And that he wants to do something this morning in our lives. Just like you, I'm the same. I want to come to communion so that God can work in my life something he wants to work in my life. I don't want to leave this place this morning having just come to sit in a chair. And we've heard the word of God. And that's something that we do on a regular basis because we need it because it grows our faith. And as pastor ministers, we don't leave the same as we came in. And that's something that when someone said, you can bank on. Amen? Amen. Remembering and honoring what God has done is vital to receiving all that he has to offer us. The power of the blood of Jesus can reach every issue of your life and make it whole there's power in the blood of jesus Amen. i was uh, just thinking this morning as i was preparing for this and i jotted this down i had the privilege when i was in college uh, of sitting right next to one of the greatest songwriters and one of the greatest vocalists at that time andre crouch how many may remember the name andre crouch and uh, learned a lot. And one of the songs that he wrote during that time was The Blood. It reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. So ma no matter what our situation this morning, God's blood is here to change us. To, to make sure that we walk out of this place having dealt with issues that we confront and he confronts in our lives as we receive this morning and we contemplate and I even ask him to do certain things in our life and I'll get again to that now Jesus said here's the pattern and I said earlier there were three things that I want to talk to first thing is to recognize that when Jesus set forth communion it's the pattern that he set for us. He established that we should be doing that. And this this morning. Remember what was accomplished for you. He is saying when my body was broken for you. Remember what is provided for you. Because my blood was shed for you. That's the pattern of the Lord's table. In other words he shares a pattern here. He's not just spouting off. He's saying, this is the pattern for you. I want you to remember that my body was broken for you. I want you to remember that my blood was shed for you. And that there is power in these things. Secondly, Jesus also declares, as we receive this morning, his purpose. And in the next verse, verse 26 he says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. 
by coming to the Lord's table, then we're making an announcement about everything that Jesus has done for us through the cross. Communion is not only a devotional exercise. That means when we sit here, often we, as we meditate on what God has done, not just a passing thought, but meditate on what he's done, remembering that, that um, there is also something else that happened. We make an announcement about everything that Jesus has done for us through the cross. Just by participating, we're making an announcement. It's intended to speak forth something, to speak it for my own remembrance. In other words, so that I would think about what I'm doing, contemplate what I'm doing, recognize what I'm doing. This is not just a passing thought. It's something we need to take a moment and look at our hearts and let God minister. So it's intended to speak for something, to speak it for my own remembrance and to speak it for everyone else's hearing and understanding. Did you know that? That as you receive this morning, as we walk by and as we stand, we are actually proclaiming to those around us, we believe that Jesus died on the cross and that he rose again and that he intercedes for us right now. And that he is interceding for each one of us that as we receive this morning, something will change in our life. He's not just up there picking his nose. Amen? Amen. He's there looking at us, knowing us, and desiring that something new and fresh happen in our lives. So I want to read on. And we come to make this declaration. I'd like to ask each of you this morning to turn to the person next to you and say to them graciously and lovingly, don't shout it, okay? I want you to say this. Jesus died for you and he died for me. Let's do that right now. Let's turn to the one. Jesus died for you, and he died for me. Amen. Lastly, our coming together and partaking of the blood and the cup is an occasion when the Holy Spirit desires to release the flow of God's power into our lives. That's why we're not supposed to take it lightly. Now, later on, Paul even instructs us and tells us, actually gives us insight why things don't happen in our life. And it dates back to this. He's saying things don't change in our life because we don't allow the power of God to change us during this event. Amen. We take it too lightly. It's just an occasion or it's just something we do. We need to recognize right now that the power of God is present to touch your need. And I want you to take a moment right now and think about what the need is in your life. Everyone has it. I have it. You have it. The person sitting next to you has it. They have a need. And so let's do circumspectly. Let's take just for a few moments. With God. Jesus wants us to experience the full benefits of his broken body and shed blood. What is your need? And I trust this morning, I don't care whether your need is physical, spiritual, mental, relational, emotional. Jesus is here and present to meet the need of every person in that this building that's you and me father i thank you for this day and lord i thank you for what, what we have because of you we have this great nation because of you and so lord we thank you for our sins are forgiven we have the ability to come to you for whatever need we have but lord i do i pray right now for this nation 
Yes. Lord, forgive us our sins, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, of, of turning our backs to you. But, Lord, I thank you for righteous leaders. I thank you, Lord, for there are, there are righteous leaders. Give them strength and give them favor. And for the others, Lord, you know whether they're going to bow their knee to you in turn. And if they won't, I pray the same thing as David. Let them be replaced. But, Father, let us be people who wholeheartedly, undividedly worship and love and declare your greatness and your greatness and grace over this country of ours. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless America.